All right, kids, so we're going to kick off with our first lesson for Blood on the River. This is going to cover chapters 8, 9, and 10. What you should have in front of you for this lesson is your response journal and your vocab journal. So quickly, we're going to review what we went over at the end of chapter 7. We went over this in class. At the beginning of chapter 7, Reverend Hunt saved Captain Smith's life from being hanged. And we talked about what this reveals about Reverend Hunt's character, that he's the type of person who is willing to do all that he can to ensure the survival of the colony. He knows that Captain Smith will play a very big part in this, so he goes out of his way to save him. Now, when we move into chapter 8, pretty quickly Samuel gets into yet another fight with Richard and James. He gets busted by Captain Smith, who pulls him aside and says, stand on one foot, you fool. Now, we talked about this quote. Because Samuel, as we see, has a lot of trouble standing on one foot on the ship and keeping his balance. And Captain Smith goes on to push him and push him until he falls over again and again and again. This is a metaphorical statement. He obviously doesn't mean stand on one foot as a punishment. He means that by standing on one foot, you're choosing only to support yourself and not the growth or success or survival of anyone else. He continues this metaphor by saying this colony will need to stand on many legs if we are not to be toppled by the Virginia wilderness. Now again, we talked about the fact that he doesn't mean literally everyone needs to stand on two legs, but that to be successful, everyone has to stand as one unified force to be able to ensure their survival. Now this is very important, especially because Captain Smith has in some ways stood on one leg, especially when he critiques the gentleman. But he's trying to impart this message to Samuel. You need to work together with James and Richard for all of us to be able to survive. While he does make Samuel literally do this, he is speaking figuratively. What does this teach us about Captain Smith? That he too is learning from being saved by Reverend Hunt, from being hanged, and that he's passing this wisdom on to Samuel, who also needs to learn this lesson, that everyone needs to work together to be able to survive. So I know that we've talked about this all year, but as a reminder, a metaphor is a phrase that describes something by comparing it to something else. So when he says stand on one foot, he says you are only representing yourself. When he says we must stand on many legs, he means we must all work together. This also applies to when you stand for something or stand against something. You're not literally standing up and saying I agree or I protest, it's the actions that you take that demonstrate if you feel passionately towards or passionately against something. This is figurative language. We are making comparisons between something that is real and tangible to something that is abstract. Does that make sense? If not, make sure to leave me a comment and let me know that we need to go over metaphors just a bit more. Now that we're done with our little review of figurative language, our objective for today is to analyze how someone's death highlights the social factors that threaten Jamestown and help to advance some emerging big ideas. You need to have read chapters 9 and 10 of Blood on the River or listen to them on YouTube before we go into this lesson. Otherwise, it's going to have lots of spoilers and you're going to be mad and that's not going to be fun. So please make sure that you have read or listened to those chapters before you go any further on this lesson. Otherwise, hit pause and come back when you're ready. Okay, so thinking about big ideas and social factors. Our first task is how do context clues help to reveal what a palisade is on page 72. So on page 72, Captain Smith says, I believe the savages are spying on us. I have watched the way they look when they are here. We have invaded their land and I believe that they will fight us to get it back. We must build a palisade to protect the settlement. President Wingfield disagrees. He says, if we build a palisade, it will look as if we are their enemies. We will build no fortification. So then it goes on to say that his suspicion runs like poison through the settlements. What if they are spying on us? What if they are planning an attack? How, we, how will we protect ourselves if we have no palisades? So why would certain settlers feel like they need a palisade? We can go through context clues and figure out that what this means is a big wall, something that will protect the settlement from attack. Just as we've talked a lot about metaphor, we've also talked a lot about big ideas or themes. This is a main idea that comes up multiple times throughout a text. Think about how we've talked about this in our previous readings. 
So thinking about social factors or issues that create conflict within a community, how does the interaction between Smith and Wingfield, this conversation they have about the Palisades, highlight a social factor that threatens the development of Jamestown? They have fought and fought and fought. Captain Smith is not on this officer's committee. Uh, Master Wingfield is the president of the colony right now, and they disagree about this fundamental thing that could help to protect the colony. Does this represent a social factor? Does this threaten the colony? Or does it work to keep them safe? I want you to think about how this could represent a big idea. How two people who don't trust or respect each other have to make decisions that affect other people's lives. Could this be a recurring theme throughout the text? Speaking of people who don't trust or respect each other, Samuel does not trust James and Richard, nor do they trust him. This is kind of a smaller version of the conflict between Captain Smith and Master Wingfield. Do you think that this will eventually kind of indicate whether or not they can stay safe? Do they need to work together to survive, even though they're not adults in an authority kind of capacity? As we can see, it does. James being shot because he flees from the tent to get back to the ship, because he refuses to listen to Samuel, ultimately results in his death. But Samuel has given him absolutely no reason to trust him to keep him safe. So really, James's decision makes sense. He doesn't think Samuel has his best interests at heart, so he's going to try and protect himself. While James' death isn't obviously Samuel's fault, this social factor has a lot to do with what happens to him. More than likely, if there had been trust between the boys, James would have been more likely to listen and could have possibly stayed safe. Something I want you to think about is why is it hard for people to listen to interpret or to understand, especially if the person that they're talking to has a different opinion or perspective than they do, like Captain Smith and Master Wingfield. So for example, they don't respect each other. So automatically, they're going to be less likely to accept each other's point of view. Similarly, the boys don't respect each other, so they're going to be less likely to agree with their opinion. This is something that we interact with regularly. You are more likely to follow the advice of someone you like, trust, and respect than you are to take advice from someone who you don't know as well, or perhaps who you don't like or don't respect. You're not going to hold their opinion in as high of a regard because of your perspective or how you feel about them. As we know, James was shot and killed by a Native American. But who are all of the people or groups that could be responsible for James's death? Inadvertently, meaning perhaps not directly. Who else could we hold responsible for what happened to him? Who do we think is most responsible? Who has the most blame to shoulder here? Now that we've thought about these things for a little bit, and hopefully you've jotted down some notes in your response journal. Uh, and if you haven't and you think it would be helpful, please rewind and jot down some stuff that you think is important or that could contribute to your response. I want you to write down some of your thoughts in a discussion post. I will post this discussion post on Schoology and you will be able to contribute your answers to these questions. Your responses should include complete sentences no vague pronouns, and your answer should come from chapters 8, 9, or 10. So please make sure to either watch those chapters again or to use the text on Schoology to make sure that you are using evidence from the right place. Your response should include, what is one way that Samuel has changed so far since the beginning of the book? You have a notice and wonder chart about Samuel in your response journal and how he acted at the beginning. So you can compare that to the way that he's behaving now, especially in light of James' death. I would like you to use evidence from the text to back up your claim. So please make sure to take a look in the book, uh, most likely in chapters 8, 9, and 10. I don't know why I said most likely, definitely. The second question I would like you to answer is what is one social factor that is causing conflict for the English settlers? We went over two social factors just in this video. So you can go back and look at those and render that response in a complete sentence, or you can provide a different one of your own. 
The third question is what is one environmental factor that is causing conflict for the English settlers? So this is something in the environment, the area of Jamestown, the woods, and the surrounding areas that is causing conflict for the settlers. I kind of referred to some of this, but not directly. So if you have questions, leave me a comment. But think about the area around them. What kind of struggles are they encountering as they set up their new home in this new environment? And last but not least, I would like you to respond to what is one big idea that you think is developing in the book so far? An idea that maybe we began with and that has evolved that you think will go through the entire narrative? or maybe just something that you think is important that will continue to grow as we read. Again, complete sentences, no vague pronouns, use evidence, at least one piece of evidence from chapter eight, chapter nine, or chapter 10. Please leave me a comment on YouTube or Schoology or send me an email if you have any questions about this and I'll have the due date for that up shortly. Thanks kids.